Nicole, welcome to Resilient Retail. I am so excited to have you at the end of the season. Uh, you have such an interesting, incredible life career story that I'm excited to dive into. Uh, can you start out by just kind of walking us through that crazy life story of yours? <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll do the abridged version. Uh, I grew up in Jacksonville, Florida. I'm the oldest of three girls. I have two younger sisters. When I was nine years old, uh, my mom came to me and let me know that we were leaving my father. He was not is a good man, but was uh, an alcoholic. And so when I was nine and my sisters were three and six, uh, and my mom was in her late twenties, uh, wow. we, yeah, <laughs> we, uh, we went out on our own and she was what was called a secretary at the time. And so all that to say, went from being sort of middle-class, the only middle-class family on either side of our family, everyone else was dirt poor, but my dad, ironically, the alcoholic had a fantastic job. Yeah. Um, when, when we left, we were incredibly poor very quickly. And my mom fed us on a food budget of $10 a week for three years. She worked multiple jobs. I started working when I was very young uh, at 15. And, and then I, you know, the work continued. I was the first person in my family to get into college. I became a hostess at Hooters at 17, a waitress at 18. By 18, I graduated high school, got into college, continued being a waitress. Uh, and then a few really interesting things happened that seemed normal at the time. And upon reflection, were, were big trajectory uh, shifts that would end up shaping the rest of my life and career. One is I ended up working every job in the restaurant. So the cooks quit one day, the bartender needed help, the manager needed help, and all those opportunities to be helpful ended up unintentionally building a resume that made me qualify mm. uh, to go open restaurants around the world. And when I was 19, still in college, I was asked to be a part of the training team to launch the first ever Hooters in Sydney, Australia. I had never been on a plane. I did not have a passport. I'd never opened a restaurant before. I'd only been out of the state of Florida twice <laughs> in my life or a couple of times. Yeah. Competitions and trips. And so um, that was interesting because I said yes, thinking it just sounded cool. Yeah. And uh, came back. I, I went to Sydney, opened the, the restaurant. It was so much fun. Um, came back, made up the classes I missed in college, went back to work. I'm still an hourly employee, nights and weekends. And then 60 days later, I was asked to go do the same thing in Central America, launch the first of the franchise in Mexico City. Wow. Um, and, then, and then shortly thereafter to do the same thing, the first one in South America, in Buenos Aires, in Argentina. And before I knew it, I was this person, not just on these teams, but starting to lead them, going to these countries, setting up supply chain, training franchisees. And I was failing college because I was traveling so much. Yeah. So by the age of 20... Um, I dropped out of college because I just thought this gig for which I have no certainty, no contract, no guarantees of opening restaurants around the world is so much fun. I'm really good at it. Um, and it looks like there's going to be, be more of it. So NBD, you know, have a deal <laughs> and, and keep traveling. And um, luckily, Hooters was growing. Their corporate office called uh, and offered me an opportunity to interview for my first corporate gig. So I moved to Atlanta at the age of 20 to work in a corporate office. And, you know, the headline is, as the company grew, I grew by 26. I was vice president of the wow. company. Um, I was an executive through crazy growth. We're happy to go into any of that chapter. I did a lot of volunteering in that period of my life, which is what bridged in all the humanitarian element, both in the U.S. and in Eastern Africa, and, and then was recruited to become the president of Cinnabon at um, 31, just before I was 32, and started running the brand, turned it around out of the recession, built a multi-channel uh, global branded empire on the foundation of this amazing product, uh, and then moved up in that parent company, Focus Brands, became group president. Uh, about four years later, set up this multi-channel division, which is a bit of an unusual thing in the restaurant industry to do e-com, CPG, wholesale, all these other channels outside of our own retail distribution. Um, and that is an incredible, highly profitable machine in the business <laughs> yeah. building engine as well. And then two years after I set that up, I hired a successor, got him in place to be the president of that group, and then rolled it all up and became COO and president of the company 
doing uh, anywhere, depends on the year and some of the big licensing deals, but between four and five billion in global consumer product sales, 7,000 locations, seven brands today, um, thousands of franchisees. And um, that's the jam. And then outside of that, I'm an investor and advisor of growth stage companies, some startups, some more proper central growth stage heading to scale or pre-IPO. Uh, and I'm a mom of two babies and my husband's in venture. So I have this bridge between the commercial big brand world and Main Street because it's franchising and yeah. then venture with our angel investing and uh, his venture activity. So live in a handful of different worlds. Yeah. <laughs> Very resilient retail. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I think uh, your story is one of just absolute resilience from age nine through to kind of the rest of your career. Something that I, I've listened to this story now a couple of times and something that I keep hearing that I really want to ask you about is this kind of built in entrepreneurial spirit almost of, you know, you're, you're 17, 18, you're a waitress, but at that age, I think a lot of kids, they go into kind of restauranting and, and it seems like a normal way to start making money as a young age. But a lot of times you're just, you know, oh yeah, I'm just, I'm just a waitress. I show up, I do my job, I go home, I go hang out with my friends, but you had this built in knack of, well, the cooks quit. I'm just going to go do that. And now I'll go figure out the hosting. I'll figure out the bartending. I'll just do it. What do you think that was from a young age that was just like in your DNA to just say, I'll just keep, keep building skills and building these things. And it puts you in a position to where you could, without formal training, say, yeah, I know how to open a restaurant now. Cause I could literally run the whole place by myself. Yeah. I, over the years I've reflected on this. And if I think of the DNA, that question, like what is it in the fabric of my mind or, or the decision-making process that was present early and seems to still be there with these other, um, mm -hmm. other ways that I say yes before I'm ready or get into entrepreneurial activity. And I think it comes down to three dynamics at play in my mind. One is I genuinely want to be helpful. I'm a helper. I'm that yeah. person. Somebody drops something, I pick it up. Somebody's needed to cross the street, I'm, I'm there. And there is a deep desire to help those who want or need help. Um, and that is a pillar of my, um, what appears to be an entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. The second is a deep, um, insatiable curiosity. I am super curious. Like, how do you do that? And can I do that? And is it really that hard? And if I screw it up, is it really going to be that bad? You know, this just this deep, deep curiosity. And so that's the second pillar. It's It's been there forever. I still have it today. I look up at airplanes and I wonder who's in there and where are they going? And are they sad or are they happy? And are they looking down at the ground right now? Mm -hmm. Like that, it's just always, always going. I wonder. Yeah. Um, not wonder, but wonder. Mm -hmm. uh, and. And then the third is um, selfishness. I, you know, I, it, it, in the case of the restaurant days, the more shifts I worked, the more I got paid. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the better I was at my job as a waitress, the, the more, the higher tips were. And, and the more I understood the restaurant, the better relationship I could have with the cooks, the faster I got my food. Again, very self-serving. There was this clarity around the connection between how I benefited yeah. from what I did. Um, and that is this triumvirate of helpfulness, curiosity, and, and whatever you want to call it, self-servingness, self-survival, um, being driven to grow myself as an individual that I think that I'm very comfortable saying that and talking about it and owning it and appreciating the role it has in my thought process and yeah. recognizing to some degree it's there for others often as well. So I think that's the, those are the three strands of the, of the DNA, I think. Yeah. And I feel like that's actually what I've discovered throughout this season and talking to all these small business owners is those are three kind of key components of just natural entrepreneurship is one, starting with that, I want to just be helpful and serve. And I think we've seen this massive trend where consumers want entrepreneurs who are thinking in that way. And then also that that constant wanting to learn. But then at the yeah. same time, you have to have that stake in it where it's something so personal for you so that you never give up. Because, I mean, 
it's really hard to be a retailer right now, especially. <laughs> I'm curious as to, it, it obviously kind of clicked with you from, from a young age and then through your career that there's this passion for the retail industry, for the restaurant industry, um, both locally and globally. What do you think, what is that passion? Where does it come from? It's just, you know, I, it's just seeing smiles on people's faces. I think it's that simple. Yeah. Um, it's this, it's a feedback loop, you know, it is, um, and it's a feedback loop that's in, incredibly woven into the fabric of who I am. I am just, have become so intimately aware. And maybe it is just the training of the restaurant industry, although there were signs of it before I was in this business in hospitality, but you're so close to the customer. Yeah. I mean, you're literally handing them the product they're paying for. Yes. And then you're, you have to stand there nearby while they enjoy it or they don't. You don't get to wait for yeah. email. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's either amazing, neutral, which is essentially bad yeah. or really bad. And, and being so close to that feedback loop and then understanding how to make it skew toward the light, um, that. I think it's that for me and all forms of retail, whether it's the it's CPG or direct to consumer companies, all the consumer founders that I work with or mentor or invest in, um, that delight, that connection to the customer. I think that's, that's it. it. And that is why it doesn't matter the industry to me. Yeah. If it lives in people's homes, if it is something that is a part of their lives, that is an enormous responsibility and opportunity and just so cool. You know, whether yeah. it's the unboxing or the opening or the, um, the viral testimonial that someone does because that baby food that you made, their kids finally eating. I mean, that just, you know, oh, yeah. that's money and it's what's incredibly delightful. Yeah. And I think that it's such the power of retail, right? We, we've had this conversation a lot where people are saying, you know, is there a retail apocalypse coming and is e-commerce going to take over retail? But I think at the end of the day, that human to human connection, the closeness between product and customer is never going to go away. And the importance of that one-on-one -on -one interaction will never go away. Even if we have to do it six feet apart with masks on, it's, it, it's clear that like, that is the, I mean, that's what's made me so excited about retail throughout this show is like just seeing the passion that goes into that consumer connection, which I, I hold this opinion that it's a, it's an advantage almost for retailers because they've had those one-on-one -on -one connections, whereas, you know, a D2C only e-commerce company hasn't quite had that. And so, so there is this kind of uh, silver lining of hope that I hope the listeners are getting out of this. Um, can you explain kind of the model of franchising um, and how it works on a large scale? It's something that uh, it's one of those things that I feel like I, I understand and I get it. And I, you know, you see it when you're driving down the street and you see a McDonald's or a Starbucks, but really like the inner workings of what franchising a business really means. Can you just t walk us through what that model looks like? Yeah, I would love to. And I don't get to talk about it often enough. Um, <laughs> I am the doula of franchising like, I <laughs> yeah. more than most people will ever learn. Um, and because I've done it professionally and helped so many others think through franchise like models. So I'll break it down into a few buckets. You know, first there has to be a brand and a business model that has evidence of economic success. Mm. There is no franchise. Yeah. You have no business charging anyone else to be a part of your business if you haven't figured it out first. Yeah. And I have people call me who are like, I have an idea and I think it should be a franchise. And I'm like, well, open 20 of them in different cities, pressure test it, find out when it breaks. And, and then you can potentially responsibly explore franchising as a model. And if you don't, if you say, no, I've just got an idea. I think it's going to be really successful. I have a few people who want to get into it. And we like the idea of franchising. Then, then you can't charge what established franchises charge for it. And franchising as a model, so first brand, you got to have a brand, you got to have a thing that works yeah. and money. Then as, in terms of the model, franchising is about people being in business for themselves, but not by themselves. Mm. Franchising gets a business from like zero to five or six. And the franchisee is responsible for taking it from six 
to 10. Mm, yeah. And owned the two, the franchisor, the owner of the brand, the person who created it, or the, the steward or the owner of the corporate entity, the franchisor has responsibilities to select franchisees to save them from themselves if they don't belong in the business or find those that could be great to serve and support them in their journey, learning whatever that brand is, and then to build a brand that is worth franchising. The franchisor has a responsibility to keep leaning in to making a brand worth it for a franchisee to pay a royalty for. Why would you pay a royalty for Cinnabon if you could make just as much money or close with Kristen's cinnamon rolls? Yeah, yeah. And and so it's a de-risking approach to the market from a franchisee's perspective, an entrepreneur's perspective. But it's also a way for a the concept owner or founder or creator to accelerate growth. And so the nature of franchising is someone owns the brand and you could go get a loan and you could open or expand your business, whether it's brick and mortar or not. There are lots of franchises that have no capital deployed. They're service franchises and you're just paying for the the playbook, essentially marketing or the demand generation engine. But the, the franchisor building that brand could grow slowly on their own with their own capital or getting a loan, you know, taking on equity investors, that's an option. And, or you can partner with franchisees who put their money to work, expanding the business. And in exchange, they pay you a percentage for sales. That's essentially the model where I'm going to grow, but I'm going to grow with you making investments in some of the infrastructure that would take me longer to do. And I have a hundred of you doing that. at yeah. one time. So it accelerates development. The beautiful part of the franchise model, there are upsides and dark sides to any. Yeah. Any model. <laughs> um, the beautiful part is franchisees are often, you know, local stewards of the brand. They know the market inside and out. So they're solving for that unknown in the way that an outsider business founder could not. Yeah. They also often have their life savings on the line. So they're going at it in a different way than somebody that has big corporate money. They also give you lots of innovation, creativity, and ideas. The downside of the model, uh, and, and that's all amazing during the growth phase, the initial popping it up all over the place like popcorn. Yeah. Once there's a lot of them, And some are growing, some are not. Many are doing incredibly well. Some are doing okay. Um, It is very difficult to innovate because Mm. now you've got to go back to that group and ask them to spend more of their money to invest in the next decade or the next five years of the future. So it, it doesn't have to, but it often does start to slow down innovation and adoption of something new that's ahead of the demand curve. And that can get franchisors in trouble. And, and then I would I would add, being a franchisor is a very different muscle than being a founder of a brand. Yeah. Being an operator. They're connected, but being a founder requires like blind optimism. Ego, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, ego in a in a really positive way. Yeah. Being a franchisor, it's all about them. If they mm-hmm. don't succeed, I don't succeed. And there has to be this balance of leadership and looking around corners to help drive the business for their future value and making it all about enabling their success. And uh, so I, I, I love the model. It's where yeah. Main Street, Wall Street, it's super cool. It de-risks a lot of kind of like personal wealth creation for people who wanted to get into business for themselves, but not by themselves, but it is a lot harder than it looks. Yeah. Yeah. And what interests me so much about this, this model is, you know, I just tweeted this yesterday, something, um, the future of commerce is local and local, meaning not just geographically local, but kind of culturally local, um, emotionally local, the way you talk to the people around you, it's kind of coming out of, we're seeing communities are coming together and people are going to be shopping kind of in this local way, which is built into the franchising model because you have entrepreneurs, you know, they, they know the city they're in, uh, they're going to open, you know, the, the Cinnabon in their local neighborhood and they immediately kind of have that local knowledge. But then on the flip side, it's, 
you know, it, it also is talking about you're talking about big brands like like Starbucks, like Cinnabon, like Schlotzkys that you see across many different cities, across many different countries. So there's this combination of it's local, but it's also very not local. Mm-hmm. Do you think we'll see more businesses looking at the franchise model in the future? Do you think it's something that will become more popular post kind of pandemic or something that's going to phase out a little bit more? I, I think we're going to see the traditional way franchising has worked, especially connected to brick and mortar, start to change because there are a tremendous amount of pressures being put on the on just the underlying economics of brick and mortar franchising. So I don't think that will necessarily mean a deceleration. It will just start to change. Like yeah. franchisors are going to have to look at their relationship differently, find different ways for people to share in value and success um, and redefine kind of the value of their brand. At the same time, I am getting phone calls coming from tech companies, marketplaces, um, people creating services that are not just thinking about, they are going to apply a franchise, at least mindset to their business, if not literally a licensing model or a franchising model. And so it is happening everywhere from the virtual cloud kitchen concept to creating virtual brands. Um, to marketplaces wanting people to be authorized resellers and affiliates of products, but giving them a playbook to do it. I mean, for, I think franchising is um, heading for a new era where mm-hmm. it is being redefined as the the model that it is instead of feeling synonymous with fast food restaurants, which yeah. is what it feels like today, but more in the way people call sports leagues a franchise. Ah. Right? It's a community and a conglomerate of people who represent something that has some similarity and get faster expertise to do it well and are in it for themselves, but not by themselves like yeah. that. And, and there's, there's enough, like you squint your eyes, there's enough commonality that people have more trust and you can put a lot of energy behind marketing it with the power of the collective of individuals. But the individuality, the hyper local, what, whether that's physically local or lifestyle local or pod and micro community, that is preserved and protected. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very excited about the potential of seeing very interesting franchise models with totally new kinds of brands. Um, uh, we had this whole Twitter conversation about it a couple of weeks ago. Like, will D to C start to enter it? Will we see like an outdoor voices type franchisee? And, and I see the potential because like, it, it marries that combination of big brand awareness, big demand gen, the power of the online data that you have with the future of local commerce and really embedding yourself in, in single communities and getting to know the people in there. That's why it's really exciting to me. And I'm, I'm excited to see how, how people start to do it. Um, taking back to your story, uh, you know, you went through the Hooters growth, you did all this, and then you were recruited over to Cinnabon. And I know that when you went into Cinnabon, one, the, the company wasn't doing fantastic and it was at the end of a recession. What was, when you entered, what did you really see as like, what are we doing really wrong here with Cinnabon that we need to fix as quickly as possible? I think first, what I recognized was the, what were the few things that were beautiful. One is the product was and is insanely high quality. I yes. mean, it's the poster child for sugar and fat and carbs. <laughs> I think everybody can like imagine the Cinnabon smell, even if you haven't been there for like five years, there's something so powerful about that product. Yeah, it's like, this is not a business that is based on a marketing gimmick. Yeah. Or a, it is a, a unique, a uniquely made and held high quality indulgence. Yeah. Like that... That's a pretty powerful foundation to start yeah. from. The second thing we had is we had related to that quality, crazy awareness and fan love. Like what most brands would trip over themselves to have. Yeah, yeah. You know, high 90s, Nike, Apple, Coca-Cola kind of unaided awareness in North America and the Middle East and, and high 80s or low 90s in other countries around the world. Like just... yeah. While I mean that is years years and so much money, you know, to to get to. Yeah, we had that. The other thing we had, which was less consistently true, but was still there, was a foundation of highly engaged, committed franchisees. Hmm. Not not all of them, (laughs) but a, a foundation. 
So that I, I saw that at the beginning, like this is what we've got to work with. You know, this is the oxygen that we have to breathe. Yeah. And, and it's pretty amazing, pretty amazing for us. So set that aside. Then what was broken? The list is very long. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> so first was what, what's broken in the environment, you know, outside of our business, um, of how we operate in, you know, unit level economics and brick and mortar and local retail, what's broken that I can't control. Mm. And what was broken that I couldn't control was the economy, um, depressed dis- discretionary income. Keep in mind, this is before sort of the, you know, e-com, Am- I mean, Amazon was around, but it wasn't what it was yeah. today. This was 2010, this was 10, this was a decade ago. Yeah. Um, so a, a different type of challenge would be yet to come. But the fact was the brand was almost exclusively sold through malls and airports. Mm. And in a recession, people, there are two things people stop doing, shopping and traveling. Yeah. And so it was just years of double-digit sales declines that came from double-digit traffic declines. And when that is happening to small business owners on an already small revenue base, you know, it's like they print cash when you're above break even. Yeah. But you, you literally have to shut the doors if you're anywhere near it or below, especially if you haven't been in business for very long mm. uh, and don't have reserves to withstand it. And being a part of these larger airports or larger mall developers, they're not necessarily the quickest to come to your aid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, they have bills. And, and so it was a mess. It was a hot mess. And the, the, the trickle down effects of that, the bloated rents that were built for a different type of traffic, the assumptions that the franchisees made in their build out costs that now we're starting to look really questionable, you know, all kinds of things that I couldn't control. Yeah. Then there were the things within the box that we could control. And there were things outside of the box that we could control. So what was broken in the box? Um, I got at by working in the restaurants, working in the locations. And some of it I I anticipated, but other things were a bit surprising. And I just worked in a lot of locations and talked to customers and talked to employees and franchisees. And I listened and I found the patterns and I reacted to those insights. And it was obvious that we were spending money on things for employees and for the business that just weren't relevant anymore. It was like a way of doing business 10 years ago. (laughs) Yeah printed training packs or, you know, whatever. There were so many things that we could stop doing that would save us a half a point here, a point here. You know, it was just, I had to make, I had to make it rain. Like there was, there was no money tree. There was, if I wanted to do something or we wanted to do something as a business, this is a self-funding proposition, which means I had to stop doing things that costed money. So I could start doing things that needed to be invested in. Um, And, and so we did that. The next was finding out the one or two things that actually would drive transactions with the few people who were there. Um, And the answer to that ended up being smaller portions. Mm. And um, seems obvious, but there are lots of reasons that business people don't start offering different SKUs. And in this case, it was because they were afraid of trade down. They were just so scared, like in a sales constrained environment, why would I start selling a $2 thing when people are are at least buying the $5 thing? And and of course, if you're not in it, the answer to that question is obvious because there are lots more people who would come to you if you had a $2 thing and they would also come more often. And when they did, they might even buy something else because that is below a certain point. And so that became this um, actionable list of things we would start doing, but that was broken. It was broken within our control and in a scary environment with a questionable future, we had to rally the team and the franchisees to be willing to make those changes and investments. And then the third part that was broken, which is more one of those, it's not something that exists that's broken. It's an opportunity cost of what we're not doing. Mm. And that began the acceleration of our licensed product CPG journey. There was so much more demand than there was supply. And there were so many points of food distribution that we weren't in. And even outside of the recession, people only go to a mall so often yeah. or an airport. And, and the business model was built around a low frequency transaction and a unique point of access business model. But why? why? It's not that it's not working. It's why is that all we do? Mm. And are there ways that the, the brand can evolve and show up in different product forms where we have the 
permission to show up in a way that makes sense for that shelf or that website or that other restaurant even that would allow people to have a little taste of Cinnabon in a way that builds the brand ecosystem, actually attracts people to the brand instead of diminishes or dilutes. Um, And we figured out that playbook and leaned in and built it. And it's a it's a massive brand. The consumer products across those brands are well over a billion dollars in annual sales and um, and growing, especially as we add new brands into that licensing ecosystem. And so that was the other part that was that was broken was having the courage to go somewhere we didn't know if we belonged with partners that could help us do it in a de-risked way with the opportunity to scale quickly if it was working. So that that was the diagnosis of yeah. what my control. Um, what's broken outside, what's broken inside, and then what's broken outside that actually is within my control. Yeah. The the reason that I love this story so much is uh, like my brain is just racing on like 18 different topics we could go down from what you just said. But the big one is there's this massive parallel between that story and what a lot of business owners are dealing with right now with the pandemic of, you know, your world got completely shaken up and you're having to look at it and say, okay, what can we control? What can't we control? Where can we change? Where can we pivot? What needs to remain? What's our strength? What's our weakness? Which like for someone who's never really had to do that is just a massive undertaking to look at your brand, especially if you're, you know, a single entrepreneur and you own one brick and mortar store, just going through that process has to be extremely scary and difficult to figure out what decisions at the right time. And I, I read that you've also kind of called this uh, s- very similar to when you go and open, you know, uh, a Hooters in a totally different country. It, there's going to be things you have to change about the brand to make it match that local culture, mm-hmm. local everything. Um, I've heard you call it learning to deconstruct a brand, uh, <laughs> kind of this idea of what pieces can we move around and what do we need to keep? And I think there's a similarity between the story you just told about Cinnabon. It seems like you went and you had to deconstruct the brand mm-hmm. and figure out what stays, what goes. How do you go about that process as someone who's never had to do that, You know, doesn't have the experience that you have? How do you even start to look at your brand and figure out what pieces are movable, what pieces you can pivot and what has to stay? I think especially if I think back to the early days when I didn't have the experience I have now, where now I can put frameworks around it. I can call it a thing. I can apply a template over something and it's just, yeah. you know, clockwork. In the early days, it was just about a, knowing a few truths. One is um, the customer, the customer's perception of the brand is the brand. Yes. they Their relationship with the brand holds the keys to unlock the doors that you can walk through to understand what you should change and what you shouldn't. Therefore, you must stay close to the customer and live many days in their lives and interacting with your brand and hear them talk about it after they're done using it and figure out what are those things that long after their moment of truth with the brand are like tethers in their back. Like they leave and it stays with them. What is that? Is it the delight that they felt? Is it the quality? Is it the price? Is it the environment? Um, You know, what are those things that are far more costly if you change them and get them wrong? And Mm. then what's the benefit you get from changing them anyway? Like some people tinker just to tinker around inspiration. And I remember when we were... um, opening Hooters in Argentina. And for people who are listening who don't know, you know, the Hooters menu, at least then, um, was primarily chicken wings, burgers, curly fries, sandwiches, and some side items that are sort of like American barbecue side yeah. items. Salad and beans and coleslaw. Um, and, and, and some seafood, like crab legs and buffalo shrimp. And when we went to Argentina, <laughs> um, it was one of the first countries I launched that I was in charge of. I had been on the team a few countries prior. And then all of a sudden, I think Bahamas was the first one I led completely by myself and then Argentina. And I get down there and we have send the equipment, you know, the franchisee orders the equipment that we have all over the world, uh, which is only in five countries at this point, five other countries. And um, I get there and we set up the training with the cooks and the cooks look at the equipment and the food and they refused to cook the food. Wow. 
And they're like, we don't, this Argentina is the steak capital of the world. Yeah. Um, and they're like, we don't cook flat cut ribeye on a flat top. Yeah. In Argentina, everything is over open flame, right? If it is meat, it deserves the flame. Yes. And I didn't know this. And we were inexperienced in global franchising, or at least the strategy around it. We were good at planting flags everywhere and opening up these locations, um, but not really experienced in the brand strategy of deconstructing a brand and figuring out what to protect what to change if you can, and then what, you know, what actually should you go after changing intentionally to be relevant to that customer, that channel, that country, whatever. And so the cooks are like, we don't, we won't do this. And on the fly, I had to tell the owner he could go get a flame broiler wow. so that we could cook this steak. Meanwhile, we have beepers, like pagers at the time. So I'm trying to message this was <laughs> 1998. Nine, I think, um, messaging the corporate office, faxing them pictures of new presentations, hoping that they're going to approve it, and I'm not going to get fired for yeah. telling the franchisee get completely different equipment and change the menu. Then they came to me and said, "We don't eat beans. Beans are a pauper's food. Beans are for the pobrecitos, like beans mm-hmm. for poor people." Uh, this was before the Argentinian economic collapse. It was like an era of prosperity. And I was like, what do you mean you don't eat beans? There's people here eating beans <laughs> on the Hooters menu. These are yeah. American barbecue. And the reality was if beans were on a restaurant's menu, the point was it was a psychological positioning that yeah. then moved the restaurant down in their minds. It wasn't the end of the world. It's how are we trying to show up in the market? It's not that we're trying to be what we are in America. It's that we need to deliver similar outcomes and behaviors and Mm. being a middle market casual dining chain. And anyone who's a middle market casual dining chain does not cook on flat top grills and does not have beans. And so it was just like these things where, but I remember calling back and our head of marketing was like, that's a mandatory item. That's on the mandatory list. And I was like, if that's mandatory, it is going to affect who we recruit and how we're viewed in the marketplace. Just let me open without beans. <laughs> and, and he was like, well, you have to come up with an alternative. Yeah. And and we did. Um, and then desserts very similarly that even McDonald's had espresso and pie, like cold cases of pies. And we had to enhance the dessert menu. And so these were things that there were debates around. And the question was, does it really make it not a Hooters if you have more desserts, no beans, and the meat's cooked on open flame? No, because we were crystal clear at the environmental elements, the the uniforms themselves and the core menu items that needed to, just because it was on our our mandatory list for us, (laughs) doesn't mean the customer believed it was a core menu item. And so those lessons of deconstructing the brand, I remember debating about alcohol because in in the US, it was only beer Mm -hmm. for 25 years. Many people don't know that. Um, and, and then we added spirits in my last few years, um, in the U S but around the world, again, the, like the simplest of restaurant concepts has a a full bar and even again, McDonald's in some countries have alcohol. (laughs) Yeah. So adapting the menu items and changing the music, um, tweaking it so that it delivered the right balance of nostalgia and relevance, became hotly debated in the early days. And then we built a playbook. And that taught me to not believe we have the right answers, but to always ask the right questions. Like when you see this, what does it make you think of? And what it makes you think of, and that question is very important (laughs) to stealing. Mm -hmm. um, If what it makes you think of is way off base of our need state target, our kind of relevance target, then, then maybe we should maybe we should change it. Yeah. And I love that it all comes back around to like your brand doesn't have to be exactly this box you've created for it when you're scaling and growing um, for like small business owners shifting from brick and mortar to online. There are things you can trade if your focus at the end of the day is what is the customer's experience with the brand? What do they think of the brand? How does it make them feel? Then the elements that go into that can change because at the end of the day, the, the brand is this intangible feeling. And so if you were to, you know, say serve beans in Argentina, 
it changes the brand because it changes the experience the customer gets, which is, it's such like a, an interesting way to break down something. But um, for the listeners who are small business owners going online for the first time, I think there's just so many parallels here of being totally. able to pivot your brand for online by focusing on what your customers actually want. And, and I think the best thing you said was uh, just talk to your customers, talk to the stakeholders, talk to the employees working in your store. Like you had mentioned, your first few months at Cinnabon, you were not in the corporate office, you were going and working at Cinnabon and like getting those actual tangible things that for a retail store owner, I think is almost a competitive advantage now and in the future because you already have those touch points. Um, the, the last thing I kind of want to touch on with you is this multi-channel section of focus brands that you created, which we have obviously seen in 2020, like omni-channel retail is the wave of the future is how many channels can you be on that your customers are on and how can you serve them in many different ways? Seems like you were ahead of the curve with that by creating that department that was focused solely on getting into multiple channels. Can you talk a little bit about that department and kind of the the lessons and learnings you guys have gone through going through omni-channel retail? Yeah. I mean, it it is such an enormous business. It is wildly profitable. Um, I wish I could disclose numbers because it is unbelievable. <laughs> um, and it's a beautiful way to build brands, as, as I've shared, to get access outside of brick and mortar. Yeah. I think there are a few things. One is understanding what capability within that channel we wanted to and had the right to own and which one, which capabilities it didn't make sense for us to own. And that has everything to do with talent that we recruit and retain, how we structure the group and how we do or don't make money. Um, you shouldn't make money off things that aren't your capabilities. <laughs> and yeah. Paid handsomely for the things that you uniquely bring to the table. And what we recognize is that we are a branding company. The way we bring those brands to life is through franchising and licensing and CPG, but we actually own IP, the recipes, the expertise, the legacy knowledge, and the historic uh, relationship with the consumer around the core experience. Yeah. And that is what we own. So the first thing we recognize with building this global channels p l this global channels business that we created, is that the only thing that makes it possible is first and foremost, the franchise business must be healthy. Like, nope, Pillsbury doesn't care to work with Cinnabon. The Cinnabon <laughs> is not a relevant brand. They're not yeah. big enough brand on their own, yet they have worked with us for 18 years. Yeah. Kellogg's doesn't care about having a Cinnabon cereal unless Cinnabon is creating moments of happiness and joy out of the core business. And we've got amazing Kellogg cereals and cereal snacks. And I could go on and on about those blue chip brands that have enough money and enough share to build their own brands, but pay our brands yeah. uh, to co-innovate products that are distinct, more premium and differentiated than what they offer and, and, and for the ingredients in many cases. And so that first and foremost is what we recognize, what we owned. What we didn't want to build the capability for, even though I tried it a couple of times and thank goodness sold it, was manufacturing. Um, we built our own plants, we ran our own plants, and we happily sold our own plants. Yeah. It's like they say about a boat, like the second happiest day if you own a boat is when you sell the boat. <laughs> yeah. Manufacturing plants, and I have the utmost respect for our <laughs> manufacturing partners. The other is the um, the selling channel, you know, the selling relationship with retailers, um, whether it's brokers or buyers or whatever that is. That is a relationship business. That is a network business. And we can pay people off and on to represent us, but these really great partners that we would go find had that on lock. And so that there was a clear line. What are we good at and deserve to be paid for? And what is someone else good at that we should pay or share with them yeah. in, you know, in the profits. It's like the pie gets bigger if you're really clear about how it should be split. Yeah. And, and then we built the company around that. We built the team members, the talent, the relationships. So that was one is that clarity of what should we own? What should we rent? And, and is there anything we should buy? Then who are the partners that are best to solve those capability needs of the areas that we, that, you know, that we don't have these amazing manufacturers and um, retailers who we want to work with. And there's always a new one coming into the fold. And sometimes there are small and scrappy ones, 
But often, because our brands have so much writing on them, um, they are some of the world's largest, most sophisticated, most trusted, most safe um, manufacturers and retailers. And then the third muscle is tying all that together as a brand ecosystem, Mm -hmm. not having it be a side hustle or something that subtracts from the legacy business, but rather connecting them together in the mind of the consumer storytelling, and even the back of house, the back end things of revenue sharing between the business divisions and the overall guardrails. There are things we don't do. There are things we say no to uh, because we see a bigger picture of what that might um, might do that would inhibit our future potential. So I think those are the the three things. And then like anything, amazing talent, you know, the right people that can build that brand. But also it was me putting in presidents of the brands who are running the brand, who run the franchise business, who own the P&L, who look at this multi-channel, omni-channel activity as a positive, enhancing, and even critical element of business and not as something that's conflicting. So the culture of the company for 10 years has been an omni-channel culture. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's what uh, I'm thinking about, like the first episode of Resilient Retail with Harley. And he said what we've seen in the pandemic is this separation between resistant and resilient brands. And I think a lot of what it came down to was the brands who saw Omnichannel as a strength and as a part that is non-negotiable in today's world. And the brands who said, well, that's something that we could add at some point and it's going to take away from the core product. So we're kind of going to wait it out and see how it happens. Uh, And I also love, you just basically gave a playbook for, you know, if you are a local retailer, you can take this idea of partnering within your own community. So uh, listeners, like take what Kat just said and think about in my own brand, what can, what am I really good at? What can I rent out? What can I pay someone else to help me with? There's a lot of really cool things happening, even just in local communities of, of businesses coming together to create more brand ecosystems. Uh, So I think that was just such like a, a great lesson in how to even think through shifting and partnering to expand your channel reach as a brand. Um, I know that you live in Atlanta, which is such an exciting city. And yeah. just because we have this focus on on local businesses, I'm curious if there's anything in your community, any kind of like favorite stories that you've seen um, retailers do in your community from the pandemic? Yes, so many. Um, I'll list three. They happen to be all in food and beverage in some way even though I support many others doing cool things in media and um, other industries. So one is this business called Hell Yeah Gluten-Free. That's the name. Nice. (laughs) And um, the founder was a computer engineer at MailChimp, um, you know, here in Atlanta and started baking these amazing gluten-free wedding cakes and other baked goods. And so she launched online before the pandemic And then right before was baking out of a um, low volume ice cream, local ice cream shop and would show up there in the morning before the ice cream shop opened. And what I loved about that is she was using excess capacity, using only Instagram. There was no website. There was was an Instagram page and it was viral. You know, she would have lines. Wow. And then um, she decided to take the leap and invest in her own brick and mortar, which you don't have to do if Mm -hmm. you have. Uh, a great food business idea and bootstrapped it. And still to this day is marketing and shipping, not Instagram, but now, you know, her own website and just watching her leverage social media while she's learning to be a leader of a small business and hire employees and train employees and fire employees. And then how long she had to shut down, you know, cause she was nervous about her employees and yeah. paying people, you know, just seeing not only the what she does, which is crazy, high quality, gorgeous pastries that just all happen to be gluten-free, but they're just stunning. Yeah. And watching her sell them, pre-sell them, leverage technology through her website and, and create a lot of love and energy in the community, even though she made the leap to a brick and mortar retail location. And now it's completely closed. And still today, she's just got the door open and a table at the front and there's a line through the parking lot. Wow every day that she is open. And I'm just so proud of her. Um, Portrait Coffee 
all black founder team in historically black neighborhoods in Atlanta, um, coffee company, coffee roastery, literally signed their lease as the pandemic was hitting, no ability to open. They started um, roasting and selling their coffee through a co-packer. Now they've got their roastery just now opening, like I've just hustled. Uh, People have come to me asking about local businesses and I pointed them to Portrait Coffee, uh, order their coffee online. They're just amazing humans. Um, You know, to to make it as a diverse founder is a, a wild enough ride. But to then do that in a retail business through the pandemic, oh. first time ever is just like, I bow yeah. and we'll always, always, always shine light on them. And then another uh, chef who used to be an in-home chef and do catering events, Wow, Julia Kessler, um, has started this meal kit business and is working through, um, through other last mile distributors and now is going to be kind of doing a co-endeavor in uh, in a brick and mortar location to get her branded products uh, out there. And um, Chef Julia is just amazing. Her brekkie bowls, her health and wellness products, what she's doing uh, to bring prepared meals to the market through her now owned channels and website, and then eventually brick and mortar. Those are three wow. that I am proud to be a friend and a mentor to. And um, people can anywhere around the world can order their products online. But if they're in Atlanta, go see them. Wow. Uh, amazing stories. And, uh, and I just love hearing them because that that local love and the community love and the absolute resilience of these entrepreneurs is just incredible. And it all comes down to the human to human connection, which I think we can like tie a bow in this whole conversation is whether we're talking about a locally owned roaster or, or, you know, a schlotchkeys or a Cinnabon that's all over the world, it really does come down to the human element of commerce and of experiencing products together and, and being human beings with each other, which is, uh, I think, a beautiful note to kind of wrap on. Um, last question, because we ask every guest, um, and I feel like you're just going to have a real good, real good answer for this. Um, what does resilience mean to you? Resilience is not, I'll say what it's not. Resilience is not knowing you always have the answer. Resilience is having the confidence that you can figure it out. And, and there's a difference, a big difference. Um, it's a more humble definition of resilience, but the way to be confident in the face of adversity is not to believe you have the answers, but it's to have the right questions Mm. and, uh, and the confidence that you'll be able to figure it out ideally not alone. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Well, Kat, thank you so much. This has been such a, an interesting and enlightening conversation. I know our listeners are going to love it. Thank you so much for spending your time with us today. Wow, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. 